Wow, this is so exhausting. Yeah, I'm tired. Have you ever wonder how your muscles are able to do this? Yeah, every time I work out. Me too. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's find out. The first step towards skeletal muscle contraction involves the introduction of an action potential to the membrane of a muscle cell from a nerve cell. The action potential is propagated along the sarcolemma of the skeletal muscle cell. At the T-tubule, the action potential is propagated on the T-tubule membrane into the interior of the muscle cell near the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Due to the action potential, the membrane of the T-tubule depolarizes. This causes nearby voltage-gated calcium ion channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum to open, resulting in an increase of the permeability of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to the calcium ions. This allows calcium to diffuse from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. Within the sarcoplasm are many actin and myosin myofilaments. Long filamentous tropomyosin proteins lie along the actin myofilament. During the relaxed state, the tropomyosin proteins cover the sites where myosin could bind to the actin myofilament. Globular tropoonin proteins are attached to tropomyosin. The calcium ions that were released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum bind to troponin proteins. This causes a conformational change in troponin that causes tropomyosin to move as well. When tropomyosin moves, the myosin binding sites on actin are uncovered. This allows myosin heads to bind and form cross bridges. The myosin head then undergoes a power stroke, pushing the actin filament past it. The synchronized power strokes of many myosin myofilaments produces the force for muscle contraction and consequently body movement. At the binding of myosin to actin, Myosin is bound to adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and phosphate. The release of adenosine diphosphate and phosphate translates into the mechanical energy needed for the myosin actin power stroke. With the myosin head free from ADP and phosphate, the adenosine triphosphatase, or ATPase site, is open for adenosine triphosphate or ATP molecule to bind. The binding of the adenosine triphosphate allows the detachment of the myosin cross bridge from the actin binding site. This causes it to return to its original unbent conformation. The adenosine triphosphate is broken down via the adenosine triphosphatase enzyme into adenosine diphosphate and phosphate. ADP and phosphate remain tightly bound to the myosin and the energy released from the exergonic hydrolysis reaction remains stored in the cross bridge producing a high energy form of myosin. Although high in energy, myosin remains at rest until the excitation of the muscle cell by an action potential and the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. As soon as the myosin binding sites on actin are open, the myosin can bind. This triggers the release of phosphate and ADP and a new power stroke, repeating the cycle. That was a good workout. I know. <laughs> exhausted. I wonder what our muscles are doing now. Let's find out. The key to muscle relaxation is the removal of calcium from the sarcoplasm of the muscle cell. When action potentials are no longer being received by the muscle cell, calcium ATPase pumps in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum begin to pump calcium out of the sarcoplasm. This also removes the calcium molecules that were attached to the troponin proteins during con contraction. Troponin consequently returns to its original conformation, moving tropomyosin as well. Tropomyosin returns to the position in which it is covering all myosin binding sites. This prevents further actin-myosin binding at the cross bridges. 
now that you are experts in skeletal muscle contraction, you may have some questions about the bigger picture. For example, how are tiny muscle fibers, filaments, and cells organized into large meaty muscles? And where does the action potential really come from? Well, let us explain further. The skeletal muscle is considered an organ of the muscular system. Each organ or muscle consists of skeletal muscle tissue, connective tissue, nerve tissue, and blood or vascular tissue. Skeletal muscles vary considerably in size, shape, and arrangement of fibers. Some skeletal muscles are broad in shape and some are narrow. Each skeletal muscle fiber is a single cylindrical muscle cell. An individual skeletal muscle may be made up of hundreds or even thousands of muscle fibers bundled together and wrapped in a connected tissue covering. Each muscle is surrounded by a connective tissue sheath called the epimecium. Fascia, connective tissue outside the epimecium, surrounds and separates the muscles. Portions of the epimecium project inward to divide the muscle into compartments. Each compartment contains a bundle of muscle fibers. Each bundle of muscle fiber is called the fasciculus and is surrounded by a layer of connective tissue called the paramecium. Within the fasciculus, each individual muscle cell called the muscle fiber is surrounded by connective tissue called the endomecium. Skeletal muscle cells or fibers, like other body cells, are soft and fragile. The connective tissue covering sub furnish support and protection for the delicate cells and allow them to withstand the forces of contraction. The coverings also provide pathways for the passage of blood vessels and nerves. Commonly, the epimecium, paramecium, and endomecium extend beyond the fleshy part of the muscle to form a thick rope-like tendon or a broad, flat, sheet-like aponeurosis. The tendon and aponeurosis form indirect attachments from muscles to bones or to the connective tissue of other muscles. Skeletal muscles have an abundant supply of blood vessels and nerves. This is directly related to the primary function of skeletal muscle, which is contraction. Before a skeletal muscle fiber can contract, it has to receive an impulse from a nerve cell. Generally, an artery and at least one vein accompany each nerve that penetrates the epimecium of a skeletal muscle. The action potential that travels along the sarcolemma and into the T-tubule is dependent on both the neuromuscular junction and acetylcholine. An action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal, causing the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Note that this stimulus is facilitated by calcium ions entering the presynaptic terminal. Acetylcholine then diffuses across the synaptic cleft, where it then binds to acetylcholine receptors located on the postsynaptic muscle fiber. This binding results in the depolarization of the postsynaptic muscle fiber. As a side note, remember that acetylcholine is destroyed by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. Once threshold has been reached, an action potential is generated. This same action potential is the one that travels across the sarcolemma. Now let's take a look at contractile activity in skeletal muscles. A single action potential in a skeletal muscle fiber lasts only about 1 to 2 milliseconds, while skeletal muscle contraction and relaxation lasts for about 100 milliseconds. The onset of the resulting contractile response lags behind the action potential because the entire excitation-contraction coupling must occur before cross-bridge activity begins. As we can see, the action potential is completed before the contraction even starts. We can also see that the contraction time averages about 50 milliseconds as it occurs until calcium is released and relaxation time is a little bit longer as it occurs as calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Wow, who would have thought we would learn so much about skeletal muscle? So interesting. Now, now I know. Yeah, let's work out again next week. This is so exhausting. Oh, wow. Do you ever wonder what happens when your muscles contract? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't know. Right. Well, let's find out. <laughs>